Well, to take the second question first, there is, uh, whether you're talking about any energy source, renewables, alternatives, uh, solar, there is a, 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 an intense debate about the carbon intensity if you take the entire value chain in terms of construction and the materials that go into it. And um, I don't think they're definitive answers, but certainly many people uh, have come, turned back to nuclear power and support it as seen it as a, as a carbon-free form of electric generation and say you can't really meet your carbon goals uh, without it. Uh, there was a tendency in, let's say, in North America and the United States to say nuclear was dead in terms of new development. Now, nuclear provides 20% of U.S. electricity, but in terms of new development. But in fact, that was not true because you saw the amount of construction and development going on in Asia. And uh, I think that um, we're going to see you know, a continuing agenda to develop new nuclear power uh, in many parts of the world. We now see it in, in uh, the Persian Gulf and uh, the Arabian Gulf. Uh, uh, the Emirates are, are, are beginning to move that way. So uh, I think nuclear is going to be part of the mix. The challenge, as I was talking with some of my colleagues who are uh, based in the region, is you need a lot of nuclear just to keep up, to maintain nuclear share of the overall electric generating uh, capacity. Uh, and you also need the skill sets. For instance, if you take the United States, there are, I think, 30 or 40 applications for new nuclear power plants. But I think the US really can't develop nuclear power now without either working with Japan or France, because after 30 years, we don't have the capacity in terms of industry and people. So there is a sort of uh, supply chain issue that's also a constraint. What about the challenges uh, down to public safety, the environment? I mean, we're all only too familiar of what happened at Chernobyl, Three Mile Island as a lot of developing econ economies rush to secure new sources of energy as their population demand increases, is there a concern that safety might be compromised? Well, I think there's always a question about that, and, uh, and, and obviously it's something that has to be managed. I think that the, uh, the vendor industry is focused on making plants more and more safe and uh, operate more and more safely. Obviously, the other question that you don't mention is the proliferation issue, and that looms very large today, and um, you know, this, uh, we see the intensification of it. We saw the di discussion here at APEC about uh, uh, Iran and the question uh, systems of safeguards or not safeguards, and so uh, that's going to be front and center on the uh, international political agenda, uh, certainly over the next two years. You didn't believe, if I understood you correctly from your address, Stan, that oil-related conflicts would loom large on the international political well, agenda. But what about, what about Iran? Let's take well, that as see, an example, I, I think, because I think, geopolitical yeah, concerns I, well, are starting to yeah, reach I think, I think there is this kind of notion out there that East versus West in terms of oil supply, that it's a, you know, a race that... Uh, but I think if we look, for instance, if we look at uh, Iraq and the Rumelia field, uh, it's BP and CNPC, the Chinese oil company, are partners in that. The oil industry is big and complex, and companies to manage risk tend to do things on joint ventures. So, you know, and if you look, you know, I, as I said it's important to understand where people are coming from. China, at the beginning of, in the 15 years ago, consumed two and a half million barrels of oil a day. Today, it's over 8 million barrels a day. It has a strong oil industry. It would be more surprising if China was not seeking to be part of the global industry. And in fact, we would be worse off if Chinese companies were not out there also investing to develop new supplies if they were only consuming. So to me, it seems very important to not allow the kind of, um, kind of that there's inevitable conflict I don't know if any of the people here saw the movie called Syriana a couple of years ago. Did anybody catch it? In which the story was, a, you, it was a very complicated movie, but a U.S.-Chinese conflict over uh, oil in the Middle East. And, you know, it's great if you're writing a thriller, but it it's, it's not, should not be the story, real I'm sure story. the ladies in the audience watched it because George Clooney was in it. That's right. Does that ring a bell now out there, anybody? <laughs> uh, but, but, I think, but I think it's where issues 
where there are other issues like Iran itself, where there's a foreign policy issue and there's an energy dimension, that's where you can run into trouble. Just before we go to the next question, I, I was wondering if we could do an interactive thing here and just have a show of hands on Copenhagen. And let me just put this question to the audience. Who here believes that we will see a worthy successor to Kyoto at the Copenhagen, Copenhagen uh, dialogue later on this December? Show of hands, please. Who believes that we will? Okay. <laughs> there's, there's a couple of optimistic people out there. Thank you. And the other side, who doesn't believe that we will see a successor, a worthy successor to, to, to Kyoto at Copenhagen? Right. That's the majority of the audience. I, I would say that tends to be the majority. Right. What do you think, Dan? I mean, uh, you, you said that we're, we won't see a binding agreement, but it's part of a process. In I practical it, terms, what I think it's like a trade round. It's like a Doha round. It's going to, I think that's the way it's going to be. It's going to, an ongoing dialogue. Yeah, I think that was probably a year too soon. Uh, you know, the U.S. is still, you know, bills passed the U.S. House. It's not passed the Senate. And, uh, and at the same time, I think the Chinese are going to be, you know, we heard President Hu Jintao's speech at the UN uh, moving on climate, but they don't want binding targets. They don't want other people. That's, that's the carbon intensity program that yeah. Hu Jintao was talking about. Yeah, and it's just a, such a different, uh, uh, just a different perspective. But isn't that a step in the right direction? I mean, yeah, clearly that's why, that's, why, that's why I say it's a process. I mean, very different from where it was two years ago. I mean, two and a half years ago, a lot, uh, a lot has changed. Uh, uh, I was interesting when we were watching Prime Minister Blair up there. I was thinking, uh, you know, you could see the the Bush administration moved quite a lot, and Blair had a really big impact uh, on that. Uh, his making it the key issue at the Glen Eagle Summit in 2005 was very important for the national community. Okay, who would like to come in here now? Yes, a lady in the second row on my left. Um, my name is Asha Hemrajani. Um, Dr. Jurgen, you talked about North versus South, East versus West. Um, I would venture to talk about, to ask about um, OPEC versus non-OPEC. That means oil producing countries versus um, countries that don't um, produce oil. So do you think OPEC countries find um, the rise of uh, energy efficiency and find the um, increase in use of non or alternative energy, do you think they view this as a threat in any way? Uh, I think it varies uh, among different uh, countries, different time frame. I think you do hear from oil energy exporting countries a concern about security of demand and the question if you're going to invest X billion dollars to expand capacity, will demand be there for it? So uh, I think that's uh, part of the picture, but I do think that's why I also said uh, kind of investment strategies, they're looking east. I don't think I mentioned in my remarks, but to me, it's really, um, you know, you sort of look at the turning points and that this year, China's going to se sell 12 million new cars in its market and the U.S. is probably 10 million new cars. That is something that five years ago you wouldn't have thought about, so that you still see that strong demand and we still actually see rising demand uh, for oil in, in the years ahead. But nevertheless, I think um, they are looking at it. We had the Saudi oil minister, uh, Naimi, at our conference in Houston last February, and uh, he talked about not only investment in oil, but the investments that Saudi Arabia is now making in solar energy, and talked, said we want to be an exporter not only of oil, but we want to also be an exporter of solar energy, because we have a lot of sun. And I think, um, I think they're kind of all, they're going, they're going through this process of uh, uh, thinking about it too. But when you look at the basic numbers, uh, you see that the world's going to be using more oil 10 years from now uh, than it is today. It'll be using it more efficiently, but because of the sort of incredible story that's unfolding in this uh, region. Yes. A lady here. 